It's been a hell of a long journey, this. I first got involved in Eurosceptic politics 25 years ago, and the first election I contested, uh, I managed to beat the late, great, screaming Lord Such by 164 votes, so I didn't come last. And now there are 17 million people that voted for Brexit. It's a victory for ordinary people, decent people. It's a victory against the big merchant banks, against the big businesses, and against big politics. Ladies and gentlemen, dare to dream that the dawn is breaking on an independent United Kingdom. This, this, if, all, if the predictions now are right, this will be a victory for real people, a victory for ordinary people, a victory for decent people. We have fought, we have fought against the multinationals, we fought against the big merchant banks, we fought against big politics, we fought against lies, corruption and deceit, and today, honesty, decency and belief in nation, I think now is going to win. I came into politics from business because I believed that this nation should be self-governing. I have never been, and I have never wanted to be, a career politician. My aim in being in politics was to get Britain out of the European Union. That is what we voted for in that referendum two weeks ago. And that is why I now feel that I've done my bit, that I couldn't possibly achieve more than, than, than we managed to get in that referendum. And so I feel it's right that I should now stand aside as leader of UKIP. I will continue to support the party. I will support the new leader. I will watch the renegotiation process in Brussels like a hawk and perhaps comment in the European Parliament from time to time. I'm also very keen uh, to help the independence movements that are springing up in other parts of the European Union because I'm certain of one thing, you haven't seen the last country that wants to leave the EU. Lovely, thank you. I want to take you straight to Torquay, where the result is about to be announced for the new UKIP leader. Uh, let's listen in um, to what Steve Cram has to say. I'm going to give to say. the number of votes cast, along with the percentage of each candidate. In second place, with 2,755 votes, 21.3% of the vote share was Anne-Marie Waters.
ladies and gentlemen, making his way down from upstairs, so it may take him some time. Please give an appropriately lengthy cheer and round of applause with 3,874 votes. And 29.9% of the vote share, the new leader of our party, Henry Bolton. So the somewhat surprising announcement that Henry Bolton has been elected the new leader of UKIP. Many people had thought Anne-Marie Waters, the director of Sharia Watch UK, uh, would have won. Let's listen to what he's got to say. So, Joe, from one lion to another, because you may have seen yesterday uh, UKIP have a new leader, leader and they have a new logo, a lion. So we're speaking to, for his first national broadcast interview since becoming leader, to UKIP's new lion, Henry Bolton. Morning, Henry. Good Thank morning. you very much for joining us and congratulations on your victory yesterday. That's right. Um, That's right. Just to start off with, really, why did you want this job? Today. Yeah. You described, I think there's no secret, that you essentially said that you thought that if the party chose her, the party risked becoming a Nazi party. Do you think that there are Nazis in your party now? And if no. so, well, well no. you must have I, thought I that. I said there was a danger of it going down the path of being a National Socialist Party, yes. Right. And, 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 uh, I, and I, I, I would stand by that. But we, yesterday, you saw that the party quite decisively decided not to go down that path. Yeah, and, and Nigel, I'm pleased about Nigel that. Farage says that uh, he hopes that she leaves the party. Do you agree? Uh, that's entirely her decision. Entirely her decision. Jean-Claude, and uh, as President Juncker has said, we have had a constructive meeting today. Both sides have been working hard in good faith. We've been negotiating hard. Uh, and a lot of progress has been made, and uh, on many of the issues there is a common understanding. But it is, cl and it's clear, crucially, that we want to move forward together. But on a couple of issues, some differences do remain, which require further negotiation and consultation. First interview since the Brussels deal, the Brexit Secretary David Davis joins me. Welcome. Now, before we get Good going morning. on this week's um, events, I have to ask you, there's no easy way of talking about this. There is an issue about your own integrity when it came to some of the things that you have said about impact assessments. You told me that you were doing lots and lots of impact assessments, sexual impact assessments, really, really important to work out what's going to happen after Brexit. And then you told the House of Commons something else. I'm going to play you two clips. Go the on. good news there, both you. The first is earlier in the year. We continue to analyse the impact of our exit across the breadth of the UK economy, covering more than 50 sectors, I think 58 at the last count, to shape our negotiating position. Has the government undertaken any impact assessments on the implications of leaving the EU for different sectors? Of the Not in sectors, there's no sort of systematic uh, uh, impact assessment. So there isn't one, for example, on the automotive sector? On the automotive no, sector? No, not that I'm aware of, no. It's no. No to all of them. Right. So did these impact assessments exist or not? No. The word, the, using the word impact doesn't make an impact assessment. Let me be clear. Do you use let, the word let, impact? Let, let, yes, I, okay, yes. Let's make sure the result is correct. The eyes to the right, 309. The nose to the left, 305. <laughs> 